Okay, so we're going to start uh, the interview with Jennifer Hooper. Um, today is the 25th of August, 2015. Uh, we are at the Fairmont in Toronto, and the interviewer, as usual, will be William McRae. We're just going to start with a simple question. Uh, could you please state your full name? Uh, Jennifer Jean Hooper. And could you please state your age? I'm 50. And where were you born? I was born in Ottawa, actually, uh, but I didn't live there very long after that. We kind of moved around a little bit in Quebec for a bit, and then, but mostly I grew up in a very small town in southwestern Ontario. Okay, and what did your parents do? They were teachers. Okay. Yeah. And they moved a lot as teachers? In or? the first, uh, yeah, in the first six years we moved a bit, and then uh, sort of settled into southwestern Ontario. Okay. And as a child, what were your uh, interests or hobbies or pastimes? Uh, hmm. I probably... Uh, well, interestingly enough, I did like rocks um, <laughs> as a kid, but probably liked cats and dogs and birds and animals and nature mm -hmm. uh, as a kid. Bicycling, being out in nature, small town. There's you know not much else to do. So yeah, same here. That's <laughs> so nature and rocks. Right on. <laughs> um, and uh, as a your early education, what classes did you seem to like or? Excel at? Mm, yeah, I didn't really excel it very much until <laughs> uh, I sort of sparked up in grade 10 physics and then grade 12 math. Okay. Those are the only two classes so the, that the really sciences. sparked any imagination for me. And then, uh, and then I went into engineering at Waterloo. Why engineering? Um, I don't know if it was like this huge brilliant career aspiration as much as it just I like I was I like sciences and math I was good at sciences and math um, of the sciences I preferred chemical chemistry so I went into chemical engineering and um, so it just seemed like a logical career to pursue as opposed to a passion to pursue okay it was more practical thing yeah so you went into chemical engineering specifically yeah. and then oh. I was interested in the environment so in my um, Fourth year, I took the environment option, and then uh, and then I started working at DuPont. And then I did a, a master's at Queens part time in civil environmental studies. Okay, and what would you consider your first job? You just mentioned DuPont. Um, would that be? That was my first postgraduate, like post finishing my B BSc job. Okay. Um, but in uh, it's interesting again because things seem to come full circle. Uh, my first co op jobs at Waterloo were with mining. I okay. had, a, had a job in uh, smelter in Timmins, Ontario, and then I had an out, outside environment job at Timmins, Ontario. How was that? Uh, yeah, it was 1984, I guess. Uh, you know, I mean, it was uh, exciting, enlightening. Um, my first experience inside heavy industry, so mm -hmm. first time inside a smelter, it's quite a awesome uh, experience just with molten metal going overhead and cauldrons and pouring out of you know slag pipes and all of that kind of stuff so as the first experience it was uh, it was quite uh, awesome really um, and it was the <laughs> first time you know in an engineering textbook when you see a distillation column and you see the heat exchanger the reboilers located up at the top well, it was great to get out in industry to understand that's not exactly how it unfolds in mm -hmm. on the ground because you don't put 20 tons of a heat exchanger high in the sky when you can just pipe things down to the ground. Yeah. So I don't know. It was just like taking the unit operations from a textbook uh, is, how it's applied. is laid out one way and then seeing it as applied. I mean, I, I love the co-op aspect. Um, I love the co-op aspect, the work aspect of engineering much more than I liked the the study. Well, not that I didn't study, but I, I the, like yeah, yeah. The, the hands work, on the, the hands on more than the textbooks. Agreed, agreed. Uh, and when you first went to university, including the the co-op jobs, uh, especially in engineering, were you one of the few women or? Um, if you looked at chemical engineering, even by then it was close to half half. Really? Um, now, if you looked at engineering as a faculty, it was probably down at fifteen percent because okay. you know electrical, mechanical, civil didn't have a high percentage. Chemical did. Mm -hmm. 
and especially environmental, I bet. I did my environment as a master's part-time. So in the early 80s, the environment was just kind of finding its way into engineering. It, wasn't, it was an option in fourth year uh, chemical engineering, but it uh, really wasn't a faculty on its own. I think a lot of schools now have environmental engineering as a faculty, didn't in, 19, in yeah. the 80s. But that's uh, even today, I think that's uh, much more popular uh, for women, yeah, in general, yeah, yeah, from what I hear. Um, so, so those were your first jobs, and then you said you started working at Dupont. What were your, what was your job there? Um, I started as a process engineer, and then um, within a couple of years, I switched into the environmental department. I spent about I don't know seven years, I guess, in the environment department, and then I did an operations leadership job for two years. And then took on a regional um, health, safety, and environment cor kind of corporate type of work. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then just progressed from there until 2005. And that's when I left DuPont and worked for the government of Ontario for almost two years. And then came and joined uh, the mining industry. Tell me a bit about your, um, your health and safety um, job for DuPont. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, DuPont's a great company uh, and very kind of world-renowned in terms of its safety culture. It's mm -hmm. got a very strong safety culture. Um, in fact, my time at DuPont, because uh, safety, health, and environment's typically structured together, many companies, DuPont yes. included, um, most of my focus was on the environment, in fact, because um, safety was so... Um, I think tightly held and um, really well managed within the business units within the operations that you know we did some things in health and safety in DuPont at the corporate level but a lot of the standards and systems it was sort of continuous improvement as opposed to step change whereas on the environment file um, DuPont's a great company in that as well um, kind of started in I think in the mid to late 80s getting really quite aggressive in that but so that work was sort of step change work whereas health and safety at that time was more continuous improvement okay and and when you were in that position what uh, improvements or changes did you on see or were part of or on the uh, environment we'll front? go with health and safety first um, yeah I mean before I joined DuPont um, in the sort of early to mid 80s, the whole chemical industry really went through a huge transformation um, from a health, safety, and environment perspective, but perhaps driven from a process safety side of things after some explosions in the industry, probably most notably Bhopal. And so the chemical industry was really up against it in terms of social and government license to operate. And that really um, brought into place this concept of responsible care. And that I, I entered sort of just at the tail end of the first five years of that, where sort of common principles, common systems, common uh, standards were being deployed across the industry worldwide. I mean, each country had its sort of national flavor of that. Um, but I came in at the tail end of that and, and probably the biggest transformation was in the process safety side of things. So not, you know, sort of task safety or rule safety, but um, those big type of disasters that thankfully don't happen very frequently, but when they do, the consequences to human life are catastrophic. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that really was a big focus in health and safety um, when I when I joined. It was probably more focus on that than on the, the environment. No, from a safety perspective, if I break it down into kind of okay. behavioral safety or safety rules or task-based safety controls or those things that, are, that happen frequently but low consequence, I mean this is sort of safety okay. lingo, lingo now. Um, I think, you know, DuPont as a company had, has a good record in both actually, process safety and, and in kind of personal safety. Um, but there was a lot of work done on the process safety side for sure, looking at the, 
high hazard processes and what if analysis, what could go wrong, what are our controls, okay. uh, putting in processes to systemically review that every certain period of time depending on the hazard of the process and that kind of thing. So very uh, safety was very connected and still is very connected to the technical uh, piece of the business. And as for the environment, what was what kind of work did you do there, and, and how did Dupont see see the environment then? I guess what uh, what kind of uh, issues were they facing, or what uh, I guess were their main goals? Yeah, so the big um, I mean, in my early years of, of Dupont, I was located in one one operation and uh, Kingston site, Kingston, Ontario. So my work there was very much looking at the emissions and the baselines and, and so not only meeting regulations but going well beyond. And, uh, and uh, I think I forget what year, but in the early 90s there was a, a new VP of Safety, Health and Environment that came in and a new CEO. Um, and they, uh, they brought in the phrase, the goal is zero and for health, safety, and environment. So zero injuries, zero illnesses, zero incidents, environmental incidents, and zero waste and emissions. So, you know. <laughs> tough goal. It's a, it's a tough goal, but what it did was sort of transform the mindset. And so, you know, businesses um, started to look for uh, uses for their byproducts. So one, you know, Corian countertops really fine, like really high-end material, um, and so they, you know, but it's all shaped, and so as you cut a sink or you cut a counter, there's always Waste. going to be excess, and so instead of landfilling, paying to landfill a really expensive material, they found other uses for that. And, I mean, it's something as simple as making a Corian pen, beautiful decorative pen that can be given as awards, so there was a real, I guess, mindset shift um, looking at waste as a a valuable commodity. And then the other big focus um, in DuPont in the kind of late 80s, early 90s uh, was, and I'm sure still is, is climate change. Um, and then the other focus back then was um, ozone depletion because mm -hmm. the refrigerants were primary um, like high ozone depleters and so transforming that business unit into uh, we still needed refrigeration but how do you do that without using the flow products um, that also caused uh, ozone depletion and then in climate change um, there was one process emission associated with the nylon business that uh, was high climate change uh, greenhouse gas factor and so the abatement system and so yeah we got into so, and it was not only controlling the emissions and finding outlets for um, what used to be considered waste, but then, you know, bringing a business concept. So DuPont was kind of an early um, company to get into the emissions trading and try to figure that out and what is it and is it, you know, is it the right approach? And I mean, that, that was... I was back in the late '90s, early 2000s. So I don't know. I don't know where where Dupont is in that yeah. space anymore. But so I would say, kind of that paradigm shift of the goal is zero uh, really did kind of turn people's minds around prevention and and finding uh, yeah different outlets for for waste and recycling. Okay, and. Um You'd also speaking of, um, of global warming and the environment. You you worked as um, you worked with Pollution Probe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm on the board. You're on the board. Yeah. Can you tell me first of all what is Pollution Probe and? It's and, an NGO and, actually. It's a national NGO, um, and their focus is uh, um, really to enable constructive environmental sustainable development policy development. Okay. Um, so working with businesses, working with governments, working with First Nations, working with other NGOs around how do we get uh, progressive, science-based, um, good public policy. So, you know, I like Pollution Probe because they have a, a solutions focused, uh, willing to work with anybody that's wanting to focus on good science and good public policy and good outcomes. Um, they're not a, an adversarial um, headline catcher 
type of NGO. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, so you worked at um, DuPont, and then you said you worked for the government. Mm -hmm. As uh, what was your role? I was in policy development. I started with the Ministry of Labor. Uh, I worked for I didn't spend that long there, maybe six months. I worked in uh, what was called the Inspections, Investigations, and Enforcement Secretariat, and um, the the primary job of that when I was there was to to develop and enact some new regu new legislation on enabling ministries to share information from department to department. So if an inspection uh, turns up something in from an environment that is positive information from a health and safety that within limits there can be some information sharing between ministries. That was the main um, piece of work I did there. And then I joined the Air Policy and Climate Change Branch um, for Ministry of Environment. And the primary focus there was working on the, the cl climate change plan for Ontario back in 2006, 2007. Interesting. Um, and then you made uh, the leap to the mining industry. Yeah. And so what do you do now? Or yeah, so I, I, um, I joined the base metals business unit here based out of Toronto. And mostly, regular, I think I joined as Director of Regulatory Affairs, but a lot of the work was on, um, um, you know, hazard classification of our products, um, you know, being still involved with climate change consultation. So it was more kind of the technical component of government affairs was a lot of the work I did in the first year or so. Um, and then after that, I was uh, um, head of sustainability for base metals. Um, so then had safety, health, environment, more of a closer to the operations. When I first joined, I was a bit more externally focused. Um, and then it was at the end of 2011 that I took on the, the global role for Valley Group for health and safety. Okay. Yeah, I know I've, I've uh, interviewed lots of people who, who've worked for Valley or Inco. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I joined shortly after the acquisition, so I actually never worked yeah, for Inco. Yeah, it was 2005? 2006. Four, six. October 2006, okay. and I joined in October 2007. Okay. So you don't you didn't witness uh, any of the, the major changes? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I came post-acquisition, so, yeah. Um, so now, now that you do work in the uh, in the mining business or mining and metallurgy, um, do you? I, I often like to ask this question uh, for people in, in the business, uh, in the industry. Do you see uh, a disconnect between the natural resource world and the general public? Hmm. And especially when it comes to a lot of your experience, which is comes in safety and especially the environment. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the first comment I would make is, um, I think there's uh, a distance. I don't know if it's a disconnect or there's certainly a distance between uh, what we do in the natural resource sector and, and what the public knows about what we do. Um, or how we do things. So I, I think there's been a, and there's certainly a disconnect, I think, between uh, even the understanding of, of mining is, is kind of the base, the foundation of industry and then the foundation of many of the consumer yeah. products that, that we yeah. all enjoy. If and that are. That connection is not strong in it's the true. public mind. So if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. That's what <laughs> someone that's, else had told me. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good line. I have to use that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this. So I don't think we've done a great job of of um, talking about the value add to the society that mm -hmm. comes from mining. And because you know, often it's okay. The number of jobs, and the amount of taxes, and the amount of royalties, all that stuff. I mean, I don't think the public has much of it unless you work in the mining industry or in a mining town like a Sudbury or whatever. Um, it's not enough, right? So, you know, tell uh, my spin coach, who's a public school teacher, <laughs> yeah, but we're 
we create so many jobs, yeah, but that doesn't impact her or the quality of life of her family. But then talk about the car and the cell phone and the watch and the <laughs> all the other yeah, yeah. stuff, and it starts to, to click a little better. Absolutely. Yeah, and I was actually doing a bit of reading on um, on how there's <clears throat> there's almost an ironic shift right now with the natural with um, renewable energy, and how the the big go to renewable energies right now uh, are wind and solar, both which uh, need massive amounts of minerals, mm -hmm. both which need to be uh, supported greatly by mining, mm -hmm. um, especially with your rare earth magnets and mm -hmm. metals and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, silicates and so so yeah there there is definitely a a gap yeah there's, lack, a, there's, or, an there's a gap a lack of, of education in in what really mining provides for mm -hmm. for the entire planet mm -hmm. um, but yes you're not the first also to mention that there could be a better job done as well from the mining industry to to make it a, the make information it, a bit more yeah. available and yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's, I mean, like any industry, I mean, the, the increase in transparency and public reporting and, and more quantitative reporting to try to point, paint the mm -hmm. picture for folks, that's been increasing and will continue to increase, which I think is fantastic. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a big difference between working for a DuPont versus working for a mining company. You know, people can identify with the DuPont brand, right? So. I don't even know if it's still DuPont Lycra, but at the time I worked there, DuPont Lycra, DuPont Teflon, DuPont, um, I don't know what, Stainmaster. Mm -hmm. So it's in their homes, it's on their fry pan, it's on their floors, it's on their yeah, workout true. gear. So it's a, it's a well-known brand and people can touch and feel yeah. it, whereas you know, yeah, everything mine is not stainless steel going into <laughs> yeah. uh, building construction or a new railroad in, I don't know if we use stainless steel in a railroad, probably not, but we use a lot of iron ore in it. Um, this doesn't touch the day-to-day -day of, uh, of the general public. Yeah, yeah, the number of minerals mined for an iPhone, they don't all go in yeah. an iPhone, it's called an iPhone right? yes. from Apple, but yeah, not true. Um, and uh, now having also, so having shifted uh, in the mining industry, um, how present or absent uh, are women in that business? Or, and I guess you're fairly new to it, but I guess, have you seen a change or? Yeah, I don't know what the, from an industry perspective, but I, I think, um, like I'm, I'm guessing it's between 10 to 15%. Um, I think that's mm -hmm. what it is in our company, yeah. and that's probably representative of the industry. So it's not uh, not a high percentage of women. Um, Does that represent the entire company when you say that? Mm -hmm. All yeah. ballet. Oh okay. yeah. So all functions, operations, or corporate functions, or so it's the whole. That would be the whole company. I don't offhand. I don't know what the split is between mm -hmm. sort of operations roles versus more. Um, more corporate functions or support function roles or technical or engineering yeah. or, or other roles there um, there seems to be more and more now there's there's more women who uh, go to school in engineering basically in STEM um, but there still seems to be less women in the natural resource industry when it comes to actually um, working so I don't know, are you able yeah, to... I don't know why that is. Um, I don't directly know why that is. I mean, certainly from a... Um, I mean, certainly there would be no difference whether you... Like from a lab perspective, say a laboratory technician or an engineering department, I don't think there's a difference in the work environment from one lab to the next lab, or one engineering department to the next engineering department. Um, it's office work with some time in the field and all of that kind of stuff, so I don't know why there would be a difference there. Um, you know, certainly in terms of our operations, I think we're getting better. Um, but there's some basic things, like, you know, there's a, a company, and I'll make a little plug for a company in Sudbury called Cover Gals. So it's just a, a great example, right? So you have to wear certain coveralls underground 
and they're not particularly well designed for women. Yeah, they uh, were they on dragons then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, a couple of women. They're, they're uh, lots of energy and real a lot of innovation, and so that's just a, an example of you know is it um, is it an industry that that is unconsciously unwelcoming. It would yeah. certainly, it's not a consciously unwell. I've never experienced it to be consciously unwelcoming, but things, basic things like does the safety equipment, is it designed yeah, it for women? Yeah. Um, is the work underground, uh, you know, does it take into account um, women's like, is there bathroom, are there separate bathrooms, are there, you know, just, and so, I mean, that's an area that we focus on is sort of the, just even the basic work environment, bathrooms, equipment, all of that kind of stuff. And, and I think as an industry, we could do a better job mm -hmm. okay. of that. <coughs> um, have you joined any, um, well, you're, on a, uh, you're on a board, have you joined any other boards or uh, organizations? Or? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I have over the years. Uh, it's the only board I'm on right now. I was... Um, well, when I worked for just for base metals, I was on the, the board and technical committees of the Nickel Institute. So that's the industry association um, for the nickel industry. And then um, I was on the board of directors for CLAP. It was another Canadian environmental law and policy uh, NGO. Um, I was on that board for uh, maybe a year or so. so. That's pretty much it. Okay. And um, looking back, um, I mean, you're you're much younger than a, a lot of my <laughs> my interviewees, <laughs> and you still uh, you still work full time. Um, but um, looking back so far, um, what would be the uh, the proudest or some of the proudest uh, moments in your professional career? Hmm. Um. You know, I think um, I'm. So it's, I'm, the only reason I'm pausing is because it's. I'm not going to answer this question in terms of moments, but I'm very proud of uh, how our company and the industry is really um, uh, really trying to. Uh, make leaps in health and safety, uh, really looking at everything from um, innovation, so how can we innovate new technology to remove people from the risk, um, right down to, you know, how do we put in, um, how do we look at the work environment, how do we look at uh, the human factors, and so the, the industry is really, I think, um, well, I, I can speak more directly for my company, is really um, facing the challenge head on and with great passion and commitment uh, in terms of, of really improving the health and safety results. Um, and the other thing I... Uh, you know, I, the whole... Um, you know, I'm proud to work in the mining industry. I really am. And, um, you know, my friends, my family, or, or some people that might say, yeah, but you have so many impacts, you know, you're blowing up mountains and filling in lakes. And, you know, sometimes people in certain areas have to be re relocated because of, for, sometimes for safety reasons, other, other because of uh, there's going to be an operation there someday. And um, sort of the catch-22 in mining, the way I've simplified it in my own mind, is um, some of the impacts are felt short-term and local. And that, it's true, we do have an impact in mining, and there's no sense of saying we don't. But when you look at the benefits um, to local infrastructure, to the future, uh, to education, to um, the future of especially some of the countries that we're going in, when you look at the benefits, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm proud to work in mining because, um, you know, 
there's a lot of countries in the world that need positive development and I think responsible mining and taking into consideration the, the, the need to provide a social benefit and a positive um, social leg legacy beyond the time that we're going to be there um, is something to be proud of and hard to communicate because the, the local and short-term stories are always easy to communicate. The, yeah, the longer term benefits are, are more difficult, but they're, they're real and they're there mm -hmm. and they're real. And as for um, a lot of, especially if you look at uh, mining, um, mines in other parts of the world, um, mines can last long, they can have a, I don't know. They oh, can look be, at Sudbury. Be, yeah, I mean. <laughs> so we're 100 years in exactly. counting, right? Exactly, it could be 100, it could be 40, it could be 20, it all depends. Uh, but uh, are there parts, mines in parts of the world where, um, because mining is cyclical, um, where uh, um, the development of a mine has helped develop an entire community? Um, but uh, is there is there a balance there between, I guess, relying too much on the mine itself and not enough on what's going to happen or what were what what would happen if yeah, post -closure. Uh, and when yeah exactly post -closure. It closes. and so i think um you know and the the trend for sure now is um and this started predates me coming into mining but what is the post closure plan in terms of economic diversification so that the town is better mm -hmm. better when you leave right so that it is has got a sustainable economy it's got um, uh, reclaimed environment where we've had some impacts um, but there is a, a drive to take in economic diversification of the community so that at the end of end of mine life um, you don't just pull up stakes and then because when when you open a, a new facility in, especially in some regions of the world, many people come, right? They come for employment. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so how can you as a company then not only focus on those direct jobs, but how can you build capacity for the sort of the ancillary jobs that will then form the base of the economy post-closure? Mm -hmm. So that is part of the whole mine development, mine closure planning cycle now. Okay. And uh, if you were to um, if you were to address yourself to someone uh, much younger, like a student or, or someone like that, uh, what would be a, a life lesson or a piece of advice you would give them? Hmm. Looking into the future or their, their career or profession. Hmm. I don't know. I think it's... Uh, uh, Find work that's and find the work and find the place uh, where the values match your own. And um, and the other thing I think I'd say is um, don't put any artificial boundaries around your capabilities or your contributions. Like you know, when you work in organizations, sometimes you know there's structures, there's processes, and all that. But you know, if you see some important and valuable work to do and uh, it's consistent with the company direction and the company values and it sparks some values and some passion in you, don't let uh, false barriers hold you back. Mm. Good advice, good advice. Uh, is there anything else uh, you'd, like to, um, you'd like to add or share? No, I don't think that we missed. I don't think so, no. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Much appreciated.